Peter Frampton, it's just a thrill and an honor to have you. We're just so excited and thank you for taking the time to chat with us about your terrific new memoir, Do You Feel Like I Do, which I ripped through in basically <laughs> one sitting. It's incredibly readable. But before we jump in, can you tell us a little bit about how this memoir came to be? Um, well, it had always been mentioned by um, friends and managers and, you know, over the years. And I just, nah, no, it's not, no. I, if I ever do one, it's not time, it's not time. But then um, when we did, uh, when we made the decision to um, do the, the, the finale tour, which we're still in the process of doing if we ever get to do it, Europe and the rest of the, country, the, rest of the world. Um, and uh, I just spoke to uh, my manager and said, look, my, unfortunately my uh, muscle disease, IBM, uh, inclusion body myositis, is um, is progressing and we ought to be careful what we book. So I was just going to do a my first co-headline tour with Alice Cooper, who I've, we've been friends for years. So we were so excited, but we had to, uh, he said, well, then we probably need to make this your farewell tour. So at that time, it seemed, well, this might be the time to do the book as well, you know? So, and uh, seeing as I'm doing a, uh, the finale tour is really um, a story of my whole career, music from the whole career, videos and cameras, and you know, it was the biggest production I'd ever had. So, and it was highlighting the, my life basically, you know? Um, and so uh, I was in that mode of remembering all this stuff and there it is. So that's when Alan Light came into the picture and I love what he does a great writer, and we got together and started to do this. So it is so fun to read, and I think particularly starting with those early days in the 50s when you picked up the banjo lele, which was an instrument <laughs> I never heard of, which I think comes from vaudeville, and then it just seems those early days in the 60s running around in London and the outskirts of London with the Beatles and, and the Who, I mean, was it fun? Can you tell the viewers a little bit of what that was like and was it fun writing it? Cause it's really fun to read it. Oh yes, it, it was, well, I have to say, no, let me quantify that. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, uh, it was fun doing the, uh, the first part and the last part. Um, the first part being um, sitting with Alan and just literally for weekends of, after weekends, so many, we sat for two hours a day and just, uh, I, he asked me and I, I told the stories and we taped it on our phones, like you do. And, um, and then, of course, it's put into this huge manuscript that's about this, everything that I said on that tape. And then the difficult part <laughs> is editing it and making it sound like I'm not a rambling loony, you know? <laughs> so, uh, uh, so anyway, that, that was the most, the, the editing phase was obviously the most difficult, but then the most enjoyable part about the book for me was finally getting to read my own audio book, you know, and threw a few accents in there and, you know, I tried my best. And, uh, <laughs> and um, but it was, each day was like a performance, you know, uh, it was me narrating my story. and. I really enjoyed that. And I hope people that um, um, listeners to uh, audiobooks enjoy it too. Yeah, that, that is a treat. That will be a holiday treat um, for people. And I, I think what to remember, it struck me because I knew of this, but it was interesting to be reminded you were very young. You were a very young musical prodigy, and um, and I and I remember that we think of you, of course, as a rock god. But yeah. I mean, there is one. I, I think just in a little bit of context, it's kind of like when you were at Bromley Tech, yeah. you had a band called the True Beats. We're all in the age range of ten to fifteen years old, <laughs> and you heard the Beatles. You broke in England with "Love Me Do," and then I yeah. love what you write here. Everything has changed now. The first time you saw the Beatles on television doing Love Me Do, you said, this is something different. This is phenomenal. They're singing upside down Everly Brothers harmonies, but they're playing through Vox amps like the shadows and it sounds great and they all sing. So it's kind of like you are, you know, people think of you as this rocker, but you were kind of a guitar nerd 
like oh. as a young person, right? Absolutely. That's all I wanted to be. I mean, the shadows were, were you mentioned there, were the uh, a predecessor to, to, they were the instrumental Beatles. They had, with Cliff, they were Cliff Richard's backup band. Cliff Richard ruled the charts and so did the shadows with all these instrumentals. So when the Beatles came along um, and started singing, plus they, they were all fans of the shadows. You could tell, you know, it, it was a, it was a, uh, they morphed into the Beatles, you know, and um, it was just something that um, I was very lucky to um, find players, you know, when I was very young that, that wanted to, to do all this, you know, and it was, and we were even, I was even writing instrumentals um, and songs when I was, you know, 10 or 11. Yeah, and, and you and people ask you to play on their tracks and um, which is not to say, and I think that people should know because everybody's going to want to buy this memoir if they haven't already and listen to it. It has all the stuff a rock and roll memoir has. Like, um, I love that like lines like, we had our amps and drums set up all over the castle. That's <laughs> like a <laughs> rock and roll. But then there's also that story of when early, early days, the herd and the who, go on tour and do you remember this in that you write about the fourth floor story window? Yes. okay can you tell viewers yes what, yeah okay. well I, I was the herd were brand new hit makers we had a huge hit called from the underworld in england and europe and um so we got the who tremolos and traffic were and marmalade were already set to do uh, this package tour of England, you know, probably two and a half weeks, something like that, three weeks. And um, we got asked to to join the the, the package tour. And um, so um, uh, I, I was, uh, so, so anyway, uh, we're on the fourth floor in the dressing room, right, waiting to go on uh, before the show. And, you know, everybody's in everybody's dressing rooms. And we were so thrilled to meet the Who and get to know them. And everything and just great people and uh and so one day um keith moon comes in and says uh, with john Entwistle and the bass player and says um well let's have, what's what's going on in here so he looks the windows open we're four floors up and he sticks his head out and there's all the audience out there waiting to come in and they all ah! you know and so he he looks to me and he goes yeah pete why don't you stick your head out let's see what happens so i stick my head out and of course there's this ah, whatever you know because now everybody knows who we are and um from this song and the next thing i know keith moon's got my left leg and john entrals has got my right leg and i did a complete vanilla ice out the window and they they both dangled me by their ankle by my ankles and uh, so I just, it was something that I, I was their plaything. <laughs> right, because how old are you at this point? You're young. 16. <laughs> 16 or 17, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but I was just loving, you know, here I am, this 16, 17 year old, and I'm, not only am I playing on, on, on a tour with The Who and Traffic, Steve Winwood and, and uh, all these, but there's Pete Townsend, you know, and oh my God, all, all these incredible. There they are now, the police are at. <laughs> I just wanted to wait, if you don't mind editing. So there is, uh, there's Pete Townsend in there and, and it's just, they're all, when I come up, I'm completely red faced but laughing because everybody else was laughing and I thought I'd better go along with it. So, <laughs> and um, then another time they tied me to a radiator, I think. So Pete Townsend reminded me of that uh, not too long ago, actually. So, uh, but then um, Keith and John would travel in Keith's Bentley. Um, and so I didn't travel with the herd. I got, I got um, you know, hoodwinked and, and taken on, and being, I was shown how to rock and roll. Let's put it that way. <laughs> By the best. I mean, he's notorious, Keith. The, the two of them were notorious for pranks and all this. So it was, I was just on cloud 
nine, you know, it was just so fantastic. And they're all just great people, really nice. And of course, they were both friends and, until we lost them both. But, but um, yeah, it was, it, was an, it was a rude awakening to the life on the road, yes. <laughs> so, which moves to, it's, and, and, and the arc of this memoir is a great story because it takes us deep inside what, what you're thinking. I, and there's this great sentence that you have that where you say, for me, it's always come down to the conflict between the looks and the playing. Can you, you know, yes. the photography um, of yourself and... Well, I think that uh, it's true, you know, if someone is, if an artist, whether it be an actor or, 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 or a musician, um, if they are, I'm gonna say, if they're too good looking, how can they be talented? Because they got there because of their looks. Well, I didn't, you know, to start with. I got into this because of my playing. So by the time, the, it, the first time it happened was with The Herd. I was the lead guitar player, not the singer. I did a few ooh ahs and shooby doos, you know, as backup. But <laughs> I, I, I think I sang two songs in the whole evening, you know. And um, so when we got these very successful managers who also wrote uh, incredible hit songs, Howard and Blakely, uh, when they, they said, we've got a song for you. So they brought us all into their, their office and and they sat us down and they said, here's the song, what do you think? And we all went, yeah, it's all right. You know, <laughs> we didn't write it, so we weren't thrilled about it. So, uh, but it was a good song, you know, and uh, so they said, uh, and Peter's gonna sing this. And the room went like, what? You know, and I said, but, 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 but I'm the lead guitar player. I don't, I, I don't sing, the, these are the two lead singers, you know, Andrew, Bowne and, and Gary Taylor. And they said, no, you'll sing this. And um, we want to try that. And it was obviously because of the way I looked. It wasn't, now this is the first time it's coming into play. And everybody realized, you know, that's what it was. And luckily I pulled it off as a singer, you know. Um, but it wasn't my comfy spot, you know, never. Now it is, obviously, but, 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 but <laughs> then I love doing it all now, but I didn't really enjoy being the front man at all. I just, I loved having, like with Humble Pie, I had Steve Marriott, like one of the most incredible singers on the planet that lived, you know, ever, rock singers. Um, I mean, just incredible. And um, I could play guitar behind him, you know, and, and really in that, and, you know, with Bowie, same thing, you know. So, um, yeah, and, and then, uh, of course, when I when I did leave the herd, um, things weren't going so well at that point. I think there was a little of, you know, a rub between the band, which, you know. Anyway, but, um, and then formed Humble Pie with Steve. I thought, oh, I don't have to sing anymore, <laughs> you know, but he wanted everybody singing. So Greg, um, Greg Ridley, the bass player, myself and Steve shared all the singing. So it, but, you know, when it was uh, the most important parts of the show, Steve would sing. But I learned so much from him um, because he was so gifted. Um, and uh, from this five foot frame, comes comes this enormous voice, you know. And I, I, I'd speak about him a lot in the book because he was a complicated character and, and uh, you know, things didn't turn out so well, you know, in the end between us because he took, took the oxygen out of the room a little bit too much. So, but, but, I, but that doesn't affect my love and uh, respect for him as one of the all time great, greatest rock singers. Right, and I think that relationship is so is so important. I mean, I was struck with the fact that you and Steve would split guitar solos. When oh, yeah. does that happen? That two guitar players, there's not just the one solo guitar shredding, and that you would take part of it and he would take part of it. So it yes. seems what comes that your comfy spot is really a sense of, of brotherhood and humility and learning, which I think is so opposite of the, as you call the pop icon, like girly magnet um, that, that I think that, you know, when Frampton Comes Alive comes out and then you notice that the audiences would change, right? 
Yes. Um, up until the time that the, um, it, it was, uh, it took six months, um, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, six years worth of material, if you count one album of Humble Pies, and then uh, the cream of the crop from my four solo records to put on Comes Alive. Um, uh, so it was, I was known uh, when I first started my solo career as the guitarist from Humble Pie. And thank goodness people remembered that, you know, so I was, I was up a couple of rungs on the ladder, not too high, but you know, people knew who I was. So, um, and then the show became uh, um, very powerful that we became this, the, the best support group in town or in the country, you know. And um, then of course, we recorded the live album and it was, it was a full 50-50 audience, guys, girls, it, it was music. It, it wasn't, I guess the girls, it was maybe because of the way I look, but, but uh, I'm sure it didn't hurt. But, but basically it was all about the music. And then the, the live album comes out and it's full of great music. I mean, I'm very proud of it. Great playing from everybody on that record. Um, like superb musicians, you know, it was one of those special bands. Um, and then the publicity starts and I'm on the front cover of every magazine and the Francesco Scavolo was obviously given the word from, uh, uh, from Rolling Stones editor, Jan, make sure you get a shot of him with his shirt off, you know? So, you know, and I, I said, no, no, it's in the book. I said, no, 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 no. And then just before I took my clothes off to leave, uh, you know, change back into my street clothes, he goes, Peter, 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 please, please, just for me, just the one, the one tiny shot, please, take your shirt off. So I go, all right, then, okay. So I was, he badgered me and um, I took the shirt off, click, front cover of Rolling Stone. You know, exactly what I didn't want. You know, I knew that would have been wrong, you know. And um, unfortunately, being in the position of being uh, within the, by the middle of the summer that year, 76, It Comes Alive was the biggest selling record of all time. It had surpassed Tapestry, Carol King's uh, beautiful record. And, um, I was nervous, I got scared. And um, so at, at that point, um, now I was losing my guys from the front of the stage audience and it was just all girls again. And it was a deja vu to the herd, you know? And it was very depressing for me. You know, I say that in the book, you know? And um, um, it was partially my doing, but, but I think that I, I thought, that well, these all these um, wise managers and agents and whatever um, would know what's best for me, you know, and they didn't. When a lot of money comes in uh, all at once, people get very very greedy, and then they work out their agenda from that dump of money, <laughs> and they go, "Wow, that's like golden egg. This this guy's like." You know, he could lay another golden egg, you know. So I was then managed uh, from an agenda of greed. Um, and I, I, I was the only person that really knew. No one had been where I was. As Cameron Crowe says, my dear friend Cameron, said when they asked him in the 70s, what ha so what happened to, to, to Peter Frampton? He said, well, they strapped him to the nose cone of a rocket. They shot him up into space. He landed on the moon. He got off and there was nobody else there. No one to ask, no one to chat with, you know, what should I do? You know, with a band, at least you get, I remember Humble Pie, our biggest word was in Humble Pie, no. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we're not doing that. And um, I just learned too late on my own to use those two letters. You know, and, and I take full responsibility, as I do in the book, 
for letting these mistakes happen. So before I go quickly to our last question, uh, we're, we're- You can go, you, you can go on. Okay, can, can we is, go on? Yeah, this is too good, this is too good. Okay, a few more minutes, okay, Oh, great. yeah, yeah, go. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. Yes, please, because, please. Okay. Okay, so, okay, then, I'll, then we'll ask a couple more questions. I, I, I just want, like, viewers to know, like, some Peter Frampton trivia that they might not, that these are the choice nuggets in the book. Apparently, you have a semi-famous recipe for scrambled eggs. Yes, it's in my first, first wife's book, actually, a cookbook. It's just scrambled eggs. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there was an amp and a whammy bar and whatever you would tell like a little more detail on that. No, a little, a, a little, uh, a little time. I put a little time in my eggs. Ah. It's a very nice spice to just give it that, mm, you know, but basically it's just scrambled eggs. That was the joke about putting it in the book. So. <laughs> okay. There was an orchestra teacher that you heard about that would go around the orchestra and kind of look at people's hand like you, right? Do you remember that? It was, yes, they'd go around. Um, it didn't actually happen to me, but, but I heard about this, that, <clears throat> um, and I'm glad that I didn't know about it until much later on, because uh, this music teacher would have everybody, all his pupils in the class, and he's trying to get people to join up for the school orchestra. So he says, okay, I'm gonna give you all um, uh, a blank piece of paper. I want you to draw around your hands and put your name on the paper and give them back to me. So I did. And uh, I have, my fingers aren't that long, <laughs> just <laughs> to say the least. Um, and, and so anyway, he would go through, you know, uh, uh, Bolton, uh, oh, big uh, um, double bass for you. Uh, big fingers, okay, so and so. Oh, tiny fingers for you. Violin, okay. And then they got to mine. Uh, they would have. They would have got to mine, and they would have gone. Oh, Frampton, piccolo. <laughs> 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 so, I, 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 guitar would not have been what they would have said for me because, you know, it's okay on a ukulele. But uh, <laughs> so I've always had guitars with thinner necks. So I'm glad I didn't know that though. <laughs> okay, two more quick references. And there's so, just people should know writing down this. I learned you know, about your relationship with spam. There's a Richard <laughs> Chamberlain meeting that perhaps didn't go quite as well as it should have the first time. What was that, sorry? Where you met Richard Chamberlain. Oh. <laughs> Yes. Oh, yeah, and you remember dear. what you said to him when you met him and your friend. Yes. Do you want me to tell that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Richard, I love you. Um, and he's such a great actor. Um, but um, uh, yes, so my very first girlfriend, probably when I was about 12 or 30, I don't know how old I was at that time. We were still at school, you know, and um, you know, it was just hold hands, no kissing, nothing. It was just, you know, virtually platonic. And so anyway, Margaret Harvey brings me round to her house one day, <clears throat> and I didn't know, but her father must have had something to do with TV or films or who knows how he knew. Dr. Kildare is sitting in the living room, Richard Chamberlain. And, <laughs> and so um, out of the mouths of babes, right? So <clears throat> I said, oh, it's so nice to meet you. By the way, my mom says you're a terrible actor. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and of course I told my mom that and she, she was so embarrassed. I mean, but it's, you know, at, there was no, uh, I, I, I spoke the quiet part out loud, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> And anyway, but, but then I be, you know, um, uh, I had asked the True Beats, uh, so it was that time, you know, 12, 13, whatever it was, 12, and um, were playing a show at the weekend at um, the church hall. We would do Twist and Jive with the True Beats, you know? And uh, so uh, I said to Margaret, do you think um, 
he would come down and just come up on stage and wave to everybody because he was like the number one fan, you know. He, he was the face of that year, you know, and he was everywhere. And um, so she's, oh, no, 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 no one knows he's here. We have to keep it very quiet. So we're in the middle of playing and it's, there's about 500 people there. It's, it's packed, you know, for church hall and we're playing away and the seas part. And all of a sudden, there's all these people around Richard and, and Margaret's father, and they're coming towards the stage. And as he gets up onto the stage, they realize who it is. And it was a precursor for me because it was screaming, you know, and I went, wow, look at the effect he's having. And they got him up onto the stage. I don't think, they could even hear what he was saying. It was like the Beatles, you know? And he shook my hand, we hugged, and, and I introduced him to the band. And then they, then there were no barriers or, uh, you know, bodyguards or anything or crew or anything. And then of course, the girls are like pulling at his hair and ripping his shirt and they had to get him out of there. So, so anyway, I. I, even after I said that awful thing to him, he still came to, to our concert and made it a memorable occasion. And then, of course, I remained friends with him and went to see him in Broadway in New York and in a straight play. And so, yeah, it was uh, very embarrassing. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Okay, two more quick ones before I go yeah. to the second and last and the last question. Um, and um, I think Alice Cooper and you are good friends, which people yes. may not always connect. But you guys have very different pre-show meditation rituals, <laughs> don't you? Yes. Um, mine has morphed, but at the time you're talking about, we were doing the rock symphony in Australia or somewhere. And I think we did it in the U S as well. But, but anyway, my dressing room was next to seem to always be next to, to Alice. And I would walk into his dressing room and he had a TV and a video player. And he's just sitting there watching really bad sci-fi movies, you know, and horror movies, you know, which, you know, Alice Cooper, I guess it fits, you know, He's, and so he get ideas for his makeup. <laughs> and um, so, uh, but then he came into my dressing room and I've got an ironing board and an iron, and I'm ironing my, my jeans. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I'm one of those. And uh, or my shirt or whatever for the show. And he said, what the hell are you doing? I said, well, this calms me down. I said, I heard Eric Clapton does it too. So. I like ironing, you know, now I, now I steam, but you know, back then it was, <laughs> I moved on, <laughs> but um, no, I have my, my journey steams for me now. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, so that was it. And he just couldn't believe it, you know, that uh, I, I uh, ironed before the show, but you know, it's uh, now it's more like um, I, I studied TM um, and, and so I, I just go and I, uh, I, I'm 20 minutes before the show, I'm dressed and ready to go. I shut the lights out, close the door, and I just meditate, you know, for 20 minutes so that I try and remove everything from my mind before I go on. And it really works. The last one I'm going to ask you about, and people will have to go for the Bob Newhart, the Milton Berle, Dr. John. Yes. You had a moment with Dr. John that was oh. kind of unsurprising. Well, first of all, Humble Pie formed um, at the time of the Grigri album, the very first huge, doc well, I don't know if it's his first, but it was the first that we knew about. And um, we would just, it was sort of like a, a Sergeant Pepper moment for me with Gr the Grigri album. He was so fantastic and it was recorded so well great songs and everything. We, we actually did numbers from, from uh, his record, one of them uh, being Walk on Gilded Splinters. And we put it on our live album because it was a party piece. It was about 19 minutes long, you know, and um, the, the crowd wanted to hear it every night. So, um, so much later on, 
in the 80s, I think. Um, I was with Jerry Shirley, the, the drummer of Humble Pie in New York. And we went to a, a do, uh, some sort of uh, uh, corporate uh, thing for the business. And, <clears throat> and Dr. John is playing at the show, at this do. So we just looked at each other and went, oh, fantastic. So we watched his show. And then when he came off, Jerry and I went round the side and we saw him. And I was just like, oh, there he is. You know, and so we went, excuse me, uh, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> excuse me, doctor. Um, but um, we are huge fans. Uh, we, we're from a, uh, we did one of your songs um, and formed because of your Grigri album. He said, what band are you in? So when we said we were in Humble Pie, Humble Pie, and a big smile came across his face and he said, I got a story to tell you. He said, when that album came out, your live album, I was in the pokey. He said, I was in prison for, um, well, I won't go into that. Um, but I couldn't afford to get myself a lawyer to get myself out on bail. And he said, the next thing I know, my family tells me there's been an envelope arrived in the envelope as a check. And it's because of your song being a hit on your album that got me out of jail. And we were just like, oh. <laughs> we couldn't believe, we didn't know anything about that. But, so he said, I've always got a soft spot in my heart for humble pie. <laughs> We can see how the audiobook is so fantastic, and you should be doing all, more and more acting because that is your personifications of these characters are, are <laughs> fantastic. Well, I'm not sure, my dear friend. I'm not sure how Ring goes because oh, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't even try. You know. So, but, <laughs> but I do That's it in front. Sorry. That's a pretty good Ringo. I yeah. Well, I do it in front of him too. So with that. <laughs> We've been friends for 50 years. So, uh, you know, I know him really well. So we're, we're good pals. So two more questions. One is a reader question and one is back to the book and the overall okay. so The reader question is, um, other rock I icons have written their memoirs. I'm thinking of Keith Richards. Did you read any before you wrote yours? And did they influence how or what you wanted to talk about? In the genre? Uh, I, I read some of Keith's. I, I, I read Greg Allman's, though, because Alan Light uh, was okay. responsible with him. And um, I realized that they were, they were good, but neither one was the way I wanted to write myself. And... <clears throat> I go back um, to a book I read early on um, by David Niven called The Moon is a Balloon. And I read that because I, I, I was a fan of, of his, um, well, still am, and um, as an actor. Uh, and uh, so I read that and I loved the way he told the stories with humor. Uh, he always saw the funny side of stuff, even if it was depressing, you know. Um, he would tell stories about certain actors and, and stories, but he would always make sure that he put himself down, you know, as far as, you know, well, if they did that, I did this, you know. Um, and I just loved his personality that came across. And it was, I felt it was similar to mine. It, because I use a lot of humor um, and some people don't get it, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> but, but I do, I, 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 love, um, uh, I, I love using humor to deal with situations because it diffuses stuff. So um, if you can laugh, I don't think there's any, well, there's a few things you can't laugh about, uh, but maybe afterwards you can see a funny side or something that is good uh, that was, was a little funny, but it was depressing. <laughs> but you know, there's there is a line in in humor with humor, but um, and I've seen a couple of people cross it, and I don't think I have yet. 
So and that brings us back to the arc of your book, um, which is the beginning and the end. And it, it's so beautiful. I wonder if you can tell us about the very dramatic opening to your book. If you can remember that day, Panama City, Panama, Election Day, 1980, and then the culmination of that story, if you don't Yes. Um, well, we were, um, we had just arrived in Noriega's Panama at, the, at that time, and I was having a late lunch on our day off. We had just played in <clears throat> Caracas, Venezuela, for two shows, two nights, and so there was a day off, so the equipment flew um, in a cargo plane this time, not on the same big 747 that we were all on. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm at uh, lunch and my road manager comes to me and says, I've got some not great, not so great news. The plane carrying all the equipment uh, crashed on takeoff. Um, I said, oh gosh, I said, how many people? He said, five or six you know, with the loading inspector and all. I said, oh my goodness. Then I went, my guitar. <laughs> and all of our equipment, it was a fireball, you know. So anyway, so then I just said to, to Rodney Eckerman, my, my tour manager, I said, get the crew to go out to music shops. Uh, if there's PA companies, we're playing a stadium, you know, a football stadium uh, there. In, in Panama City. And um, uh, the next day, oh, the next day around four o'clock, they came, when we're supposed to do a sound check, um, they all, the crew came to me and had a bunch of wires and a, <clears throat> the, you know the, the black pipe that goes from the washing machine to the wall? That's what they got for the talk box for me. And I put it in my mouth and my mouth just went completely black, you know, from that. So it was, I, and they just sat down in my suite and just went, this is it. Trying to find the guitar shop, the music shop had guitars and strings on one side and bridles and saddles on the other. That's what we were dealing with, you know. So anyway, I said, well, we're not gonna be able to do the show. So the next thing is, uh, Rodney again says, get everybody into Pete's room because we're probably going to have to leave this country <laughs> and try and escape. They had armed guards all the way around the hotel. But so we're all in this room. And then I see Rodney, that's how the book starts, is sitting at a table by the pool. You know, it's one of those quadrangle hotels. And um, we open the window and we're listening to what they're saying. And this promoter, who's obviously Noriega's brother or something, um, says, Radhani, you do not understand. Uh, I have to tell you that if you, if Peter Frampton does not play this show first, uh, I kill you. And then I kill Peter Frampton. So uh, we shut the window, we went, oh dear. <laughs> not good. So um, in the end, we were getting the guards, they didn't know why they were there. We were getting all these guards, giving them beers and getting the summer falling asleep, you know. So we, Rodney said, get yourself to the airport. It's all for one and one for all. So we ran to the, no passports because the promoters in those days, I don't know, out of the, uh, the States, would keep your passport so you played the show um, and give them back to you when you left. So, uh, so anyway, there we are driving to the airport and Pan Am is already aware of Pan Am. Oh, I missed you. Uh, Pan Am, <laughs> um, they hustled us through and we had a boarding pass. We didn't have passports and they pushed us through immigration and made them stamp our boarding passes instead of our passports. They were so on it, Pan Am, I have to say. And um, got us on the plane. We had to wait just a few more minutes and then Rodney gets on the plane because he was trying to push the guy away. <laughs> and they shut the door and the entire plane, just everyone stood up and applauded and screamed and everything. And we took off as quickly as we could. They, it's the one time when I can actually say they held the plane for us, you know, because they knew what was happening. The U.S. consul was no help. 
he hadn't he had no ideas what to do so um anyway that was that was it and uh we managed to to get out of uh, out of there the, the 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 final thing was for me about 3 weeks later um <clears throat> my wife and I were in we'd go into man I lived in Westchester we we go into Manhattan for the weekend stay at a hotel so I'm waking up Monday morning and um the lifestyles of the rich and famous guy him um he does he did the uh entertainment section on Good Morning America at that time or one of them and so I wake up I hear my name and he says yes now the truth can be told um the incredible escape from panama of the peter frampton band he said uh, uh i have it on good authority now that a well placed call was made to the white house uh because of frampton's connections to to the white house um and <laughs> and a uh um special forces were sent down to panama and they were picked up on an air force jet and flown back to andrews air force base and it's all rubbish <laughs> it was the beginning of fake news you know so, <laughs> and we were just screaming with laughter and i never said anything about it because what a great story you know <laughs> but it's all bs you know so <laughs> but the guitar well the guitar was lost i thought uh I call it the phoenix because it rose from the ashes but when my tech went down there a week later to uh, the crash site um he asked who oh, he could see in the book you can see what's left of the plane and um but the tail is in perfect shape it had broken off down the runway and the the guard said no there were no no instruments left <laughs> meanwhile he'd taken them home because the guitars apparently had slid to the back and broke off and were damaged but not useless you know so um so cut 30 years later and those 30 years I've been going everyone asked me oh is that the one I said no that's not it I lost it you know and um so 30 years later I get an email to my website um and uh I open it and there's just one, two, three, four, five, all these pictures of my Les Paul that's on the front cover of um, Frampton Comes Alive and it's on um, all of Humble Pie's later two albums. Um, and everything between 1970 and 1980 that I played on all the sessions. And, um, and I, I, I screamed, you know, it was like I couldn't, it was involuntary, you know, I said, because it's now it's today's date that's it it's right there so what then happened there was a a gray area of about 2 years when who had it um i don't know but then i did find out and this kid had it and and it's a gray area because uh all of a sudden this the father had played it he had bought it from caracas move to curacao the island of curacao which i guess is when you retire you move to curacao beautiful island there and so he'd stuck it in the closet and his son another generation later 30 years later um says dad i this this guitar doesn't play very well can i take it to a luthier um he said yeah okay no one's thinking at that point you've got a stolen piece of merchandise here and probably a lot of people will know what this is you know so he takes it to the luthier and the luthier opens it up and goes holy yeah, um he says um what well, what would you like me to do with this and and he says uh, well I, can you just make it so it plays it's like nothing's what you know he said leave it with me overnight and i'll make sure it plays by the morning so he got it took the guitar completely apart photographed every detail of it all those photos i got and then put it back together the kid came back the following day and he said son you know what this is don't you and he said uh close guitar and ran away so uh we knew where it was but we didn't know where it was and then 
couple of years later, um, the kid came back to him and said, look, I want a new guitar. I want $5,000 for this. So in the end, the island of Curacao, because no one wanted to pay the money for stolen merchandise, the, tourist, uh, the Minister of Tourism for the island of Curacao pays the $5,000. So I can't put Curacao in jail you know, <laughs> 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 for stolen merchandise. And I did, wasn't going to anyway, I just wanted the thing back. And then, you know, it took a long time, but they finally agreed to fly up to Nashville, where I was at the time. And we filmed, we had a suite set up with three cameras and bodyguards and all sorts of stuff. We didn't know what was gonna happen, so. And they walked in and there it was, it was my guitar. You can actually see it on YouTube. There's, a, there's the whole little 10 minute clip of me receiving it back. Well, and that, that is the journey, the phoenix that you called it, rising again, rising again, making things anew. And, um, and I think that's a, such an incredible part of your story of like 50, 60 years. It's, and it, you know what it is? It, it parallels my career in a way. When it joined me, it was getting me ready for the success with Humble Pie and the success of my solo career. And then it vanished and so did my career. It's almost like I needed it. I had to have it and then it came back and my career was already, you know, rising again, thank goodness. But, but it was the icing on the cake again. It was like, it came back, you know. I, I, I got goosebumps. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Peter Frampton. We've, it's just what a treat to um, talk to you and to see where you will arise next in 2021. <laughs> I know you're recording a bunch of stuff that we can look yeah. forward to. So we really appreciate your time. Uh, oh. The great, the great Peter Frampton. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Right. And his new memoir, Do You Feel Like I Do, is available everywhere books are sold. The perfect holiday gift for rock fans, those who love them, those who love scrambled eggs, just really <laughs> everyone. So thank you, Peter Frampton. No, thank you for that. That's wonderful. <laughs> Again. Oh, thank you, guys. We're that was so, wonderful. We are yes. so, I, so I very rarely say, let's go on. <laughs> <This is fun. laughs> I <know. laughs> but I thought that Steve Marriott is kind of like that, that yeah, no, it was, like, was really your, and the book is fantastic. It's just so great. And oh, you're such a you. great spirit and so not not the typical rock, snooty rock and roll star. I mean, all that, that nerdy guitar stuff and the, the Everly Brothers, it was so, so great. Really. Well, thank you, I appreciate it. All right, well, we're, his PR people are gonna kill us if we keep him. They are. <laughs> Happy I holidays. Don't tell him. Happy oh, holidays. Don't. Happy holidays, thanks again. And all right. be well. Great. You, you too, be well, be safe, be well. Thank you so much, to the next. Yes. Ciao.